able to uh, partner with an incredibly diverse array of big corporates. We'll talk about that uh, and more. So thanks again for being with us. Pleasure. Great. So as a reminder to all our network members, if you have questions, you can do what we did in the last session, put them in the chat section and we'll get to them or feel free to raise a virtual hand and I'll see you or just jump right in. I am Mark uh, is happy to, I'm sure, answer anyone's questions. Um, Mark, I want to start with one of the things that to me is maybe like the touchstone of the film and frankly of your experience and something I didn't know really until I watched the film, which is that you created an incredible culture at General Magic and, and the power of the culture you created, obviously it was based on the team. I think it was based on your leadership. It was based on your vision. Um, but how did you do that? Because you, you were an employee at Apple. You went to John Scully, who was then running the company. You said, I've got this idea of a future communications technology device. Um, and I want to go take a group of folks and I want to go start it up. So I'd love to, if you could start with those dynamics. Why did you say I want to take it outside the entity as opposed to incubating it internally? I mean, Apple was already a huge innovator. It had obviously done the Mac. And you pulled two or three people, I think Andy Hertzfeld, Joanna Hoffman, Bill Atkinson, who were you know, key members of the Mac development team. Um, why did you decide to take them outside? And how did you get such fantastic people to come with you? And then obviously you went on and hired, you know, it, it's an unbelievable roster of people who went on to do things as you've said, you say in the film, they went on to create the technology that powers 98% of the cell phones in the world. Uh, because you had Tony Fidel who went on to do the iPod and iPhone and you had Andy Rubin who did Android and so many other people who made huge impacts. So start by talking a little bit about culture and team, if you could, and, and the decision to take it outside of Apple in the first place. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> nice to see you, everyone, um, and Andrew particularly. Um, the power of an idea doesn't necessarily take you somewhere. Uh, but in this case, I brought to Apple exactly what you said. It was, uh, it was a very specific, and I said, as I said in the film, it was a very specific notion of what it would be. Uh, at a time when Apple was, was collapsing, its market share was bad, was going down, and, and uh, you know, Steve had gone. Um, and so there was a kind of an anxiety in the, in the culture anyway. And that's, that's actually possibly a useful point, is that, is that when, it, when a, the, the, the parent, so to speak, is, is powerful, dominant, rocking, uh, it's, it has also a little bit of hubris or a little bit of self-confidence and the need to focus, uh, which is legitimate. And uh, it's harder in, those, in that kind of an environment, oddly, to, to, to come up with an idea. So a lot of what I'm saying and what I said before has an emotional content or a human content. At the end of the day, we're people. And so when you come into a culture that, where there's some self-doubt, like an apple, self-critique, the problems, issues, some, some pathologies that you know, weren't going right, that's actually useful for a new idea, more fertile ground. So I came in with this very, very specific idea um, and uh, by the chief scientist, my, my old friend Larry Tesler from anti-war days, given the protests in the street these days, um, with this one piece of paper and it was, it was clear. And I was met with universal uh, rejection. <laughs> it was, uh, who is this guy? Because basically I came in with a bit of an aggressive story that says the future of Apple is not the Macintosh. It's, mm. other, things. it's other stuff. So it was, a, um, you know, it was an aggressive comment. It didn't mean it to be that. Um, I just saw Apple from you know, 15 years hence and it, was, it would be about the cloud and about devices and so on. And so I was able to be very clear. And um, the rejection was, was uh, uh, not across the board. So. <laughs> Maybe 90% of the people I met um, said, you know, later, go away. The 10%, a, a few here and there, um, uh, really latched on. And I went straight for Scully and the board uh, of directors and with some of their support um, and some of their conversations and help, quite frankly, because I'm, I wasn't a technologist. I'd done a satellite company, but I wasn't a tech guy uh, in terms of hardware and software and computing. So I needed some education, got up to speed on that, what I was talking about. And, um, and Actually, Scully, remind me, Mark, what was your role at Apple at the time? I was in the uh, Advanced Technology Group, 
there was no place, logical place for me for Larry Tesla to park me. So I was a director at the Advanced Technology Group with other fellows who had done amazing things. Alan Kay, who went on to become mm. an opinion. Yeah. That, that caliber, there were four of us or five of us. Only. And um, there were people that Apple didn't know what to do with. <laughs> who the had think tank, so to speak, it sounds like. It was really a think tank under Larry, yeah. who's a chief scientist. And Larry, just as a reminder, there's a lineage. Everything is taken from polite word, stolen from, not so polite, derivative of more Park. Yeah. of something else. So, so, so in fact, Larry was at, was at Xerox Park, famous story, right. developed right. Windows. And Steve Jobs went through there and stole it. You know, just good. <laughs> um, and then when Apple was in deep trouble, uh, they licensed it to Microsoft, which was not in deep trouble, and that became Windows. <laughs> That's right. very controversial at this right. time. Because, so, side story. So um, went straight to Scully. Scully was sufficiently insecure and, and also kind of ribbon by futures. He had seen the Knowledge Navigator film that had been made there. Um, that he gave me a chance to talk to the board. In fact, he said, you got to talk to the board. Hmm. And, he, and he whipped me around the, the board of directors, people like Arthur Rock, you know, Ben Rock and so on, who loved it. They absolutely loved it too. You know, every single director on the board had a very different response than the small D director level or vice president level uh, or engineer level at Apple. That was encouraging. So, um, so the conversation was, on my part, in retrospect, was aggressive um, only because it was threatening to the dominant culture. But the timing was, in some sense, perfect. As much as it was imperfect, we're going to get to that way too soon, 12 years too soon. It was perfect because what I was saying, everyone at Apple, people at Apple had generally invented the same thing mentally. So in the zeitgeist of a, of a progressive culture, of a awake culture, people are thinking they're not, they're not, you know, they're not robots. And so it was more like the spark or more like the, you know, the crystallizer, I call it pocket crystal, that, that the people who saw it said, yep, that's it. That's it. And they lit up. So power of a vision, power of an idea at the right time to the right people. After, so after the board said, absolutely, I went to Scully and I said, let's go. Um, but because I'd had such a rough time, you know, foreign protein kind of rough time, mm. I said, I'm not sure it can be done here. So, you know, let's think about that. And we need an alliance. Apple famously was a proprietary closed culture. Right. Did the software, did the applications, well, the software developer kit, did the key applications and did the manufacturing and so on and, and distribution couldn't be found in a store. Microsoft took the opposite model and Apple was jealous of Microsoft because it was, you know, reference hardware platform, the operating system, a few reference applications and out it went on a licensing model, which kicked Apple's ass because it was because of the leverage, you know, of having a gigantic developer community creating apps and a gigantic, well, a growing manufacturing uh, community with all their channels and all their brand and all their reach uh, doing the manufacturing. So I said, that's a good model. Let's get an alliance organized. Mm. We'll do, we'll do um, at that time, the smartphone and quite frankly, everything else. And so we would do the smartphone and smart TV. We already had this notion of a television hooked up to a network, smart TV, which is what we're talking on now in some sense. Um, and, um, and computers, you know, IBM and, and Apple and so on can do everything else. They can do computers. Again, a bit, a bit aggressive. But it captured the imagination, and so we put together this alliance, and that's so that's how it happened. That's half of your question. But would you like to have me stop because I don't want to just run no, no, no. It's great. Let's keep going. So, okay. so I want to hear. So, talk. Let's talk about the alliance because that's a you know we've got corporates here. They're all about strategic partnerships, whether it's through minority investment or or distribution and Perfect. and technology development enhancement. I mean, you had this unbelievable network. I mean, it was uh, 16 different telco companies or hardware companies. You had Sony as one of the leads, um, AT&T, critically important. They each invested $6 million, which this is in the early 90s, right? This is a lot of money at that time. Uh, what were you think, like, talk, talk to us more about, you know, what, we, what were your aspirations for that? Um, and then what were the pitfalls of, of, of like, that 
I mean, you had a gargantuan network of corporate partners and, and right. could it have worked if you'd had only three partners instead of 16 or was it, you really needed this kind of, it was almost like a, um, a Linux type approach. Like we're, we're going to create like Switzerland, be, be neutral in some way or something. No. Um, yeah. And before we get to that, just the, the talent that came, came because a people attract a people, you know, the, you know, the old chestnut and right. B people attract C people. So, so as soon as the core, <laughs> I haven't heard that line, that's a good one. You remember that? But you one? got Andy. You got Andy and Joanna and Bill. Andy, first. yeah. The key, you know, half of the Mac, the Steve Jobs Mac team came out. Yeah. And they were at that time there were so few programmers that there was actually a list of programmers who were in the top, you know, ten of the world, and I had two of them. Amazing. So, so it caught the attention of other programmers, and particularly Apple right. folks who fell in love with this idea when I was still there. You know, I published this book, you know, this um, that was in the film. If you saw the film, it was this. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, that book, that tells you kind of the, you know, what it is. And then um, and then we developed this model, which was in the movie. Do you, want to, you wanted me to, sh to hold up. I did. I, I asked Mark to bring out. This is, explain what it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's an iPhone. <laughs> and cooked up in, uh, you know, was what 19, year was this? The, this is 1991, and then we actually demoed it and demoed it in the movie in 1995. Right. Incredible. Uh, that's what it is. Uh, it's what it was supposed to be. <laughs> was, right. We did it. We invented it. I mean, we, you know, we made it and shipped it. So, so the, the, the team, when a team is really awesome, then awesome people come along. And our difficulty was, was not hiring everybody. <laughs> Um, because, because quite frankly, people who didn't think they were at that level self-selected out, they didn't apply. So everybody that came through the, almost everyone that came through the door was like ridiculously smart. Um, there is such a thing as too many IQ points per square meter. You gotta be careful with that. Mm. Uh, because IQ points per square meter means, you know, thinkers. And sometimes once in a while, you don't want thinkers. You just want doers, <laughs> mm -hmm. take order, you know, take orders in a sense. And so there was a lot of invention, and that's one of the problems of defocusing, was every idea that came along from this amazing team um, seemed cool and relevant. Because at, the end, because at the end of the day, there was no iPhone, there was no smartphone, so everything had to be invented. USB had to be invented. USB had to be invented. A and, 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 and there were things in the film, I'm just going to keep jumping in because I'm so, I'm yeah, so no, excited I, I, about this. Nice. I mean, yeah. like, like, there's this great like side like the, the team would just get excited about something like let's yeah. create emoticons like exactly. why did they need to do that <laughs> exactly exactly yeah you know. exactly and let's create a cloud and call it a cloud yeah I, that was incredible yeah. as well it doesn't matter how many six million dollar hunks and chunks of money you have you can't create the whole thing you know it's it's a, the talk about hubris i mean you cannot create the whole thing so the alliance was equally riven. You know, the, every time I went to, um, you know, the CEO of this or that Philips, Mitsubishi, Mitsushita, whatever, it was like an immediate yes. It was, you know, it was like an immediate yes. That means that the idea was already in the zeitgeist. It was already in the, uh, the, the latency, the, con the, you know, the conscious unconsciousness. And there was credibility that this team could pull it off. You know, the, the core folks were Apple and Motorola and AT&T. Well, there, there it is, a consumer, you know, consumer, like a, a great manufacturer and, uh, and consumer channels and, um, and, and global in, in one sense. And it was at the CEO level. So the credibility was there. Now, the alliance grew because of this strategy uh, to have enough licensees. And all of the six million, by the way, was not equity. It was... Um, it was uh, all non-refundable, non-recoupable royalties. And we gave them for that the, the worldwide right to, uh, to make these things. And as long as they kept refreshing their, you know, their, their license, they could, they could continue with the latest, latest model. So non-recoupable um, and non-refundable. So they were all geared up to go. And the more that came in, the more that wanted to come in. So Matsushita, which is Panasonic, was Sony's, you know, to the death, you know, gladiator partner at the time, or uh, competitor. So as soon as Sony came in, obviously, you know, Panasonic needed to come in. And so it went. And by, and, and 
the, you know, the enemy of, you know, your enemy is your friend thing. So all of these were enemies in their sector. So they, not exactly because telecoms communicate. So France Telecom, AT&T and NTT weren't exactly enemies, but the device manufacturers were. Zero sum game kind of thing is how they felt it. And therein lied the complexity. I ended up, you know, at first it was fun to get them in because, because they saw the vision at that level, the CEO level, or, or just below the CEO level. And there was usually um, a, um, you know, a, a champion that would show up at the you know, lower level who could actually execute. Um, and the champions were people we worked with and they got the air cover from the higher, the higher levels. So initially it was, it was fun because it was, you know, it, it was like a snowball effect globally. Um, and eventually it was, as I said, in the film, or as you may have seen, we had meetings with the founding partners council in the Fairmont in San Jose with a, with an antitrust attorney mm. being extremely careful what we couldn't, couldn't say, uh, each of them had a different instantiation of the product, different ideas, which is good. That's what you, that's what you want. And they were all very careful as they should have been about, you know, IP leakage. And um, were we giving Sony a you know unfair advantage over a later stage um, licensee? So there were a lot of dynamic tensions built in. Now I was able to use that dynamic tension when it was channeled forward uh, to create momentum, but when it was channeled inward, it was you know it was uh, it was all negative. It was um, what are you doing? All of that. It didn't help that our high performance team couldn't ship. <laughs> Two reasons why they couldn't ship um, in time against the expectations we set. One is that none of this stuff existed and they had to invent it, as I mentioned. There was no digital cellular, there was no, there was no cloud, there was nothing. Um, and there was no micro miniaturization and batteries that could, and screens that could actually you know, do what we wanted to do. So, you know, we, <laughs> we underestimated that one. And, and the second is, is, so we had to invent those things. And the second was we invented things we didn't have to invent, emojis, uh, as an example, because we wanted a perfect product. And, <clears throat> and, and that was a gigantic error in retrospect. We should have just blown it out the door. There's an expression, if, you, if you're not embarrassed by what you're shipping, you ship too late. <laughs> you, know, you have to be mortified by what you, it's like, oh my God, this, ugh, I don't even want my name associated with it. <laughs> That's when you should ship. Right. And of course, from an Apple culture with a Steve Jobs culture, it was perfect or it didn't go. Yeah. It was perfect or yeah. it took your head off. Yeah. So, 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 so that was the Alliance. And the Alliance was, uh, was the best and the worst experience I had. Yeah. Let's talk about the ultimate dynamic with Apple. Cause that, I mean, after getting the board and Scully, the CEO on, uh, on your side and supporting this idea of kind of incubating General Magic outside as an independent company with these partners, they ultimately, and this is one of the most poignant parts of the film, uh, they ultimately came up with a new a competitive product that they released without, it seems like you can give us the backstory. It seems like they didn't give you much notice of this. Um, you know, I, I remember in the film, it says we were completely betrayed. They were trying to kill us. I mean, uh, this is like really the, the, you know, the Shakespearean part of the story, one of them. Uh, what's, what was the story there and how did you know, how did you feel about it? Did you think it was fair? Um, all of that. Yeah. So I uniquely, I guess, at the, you know, the leadership of the company wasn't incensed to the point of rage and, you know, and <laughs> I just wasn't. It was more like the, the, uh, the Apple uh, uh, people, I mean, Andy and... The, and rightly so. Now, John was not a strong leader at a time when Apple was not a strong company. So he was under mm -hmm. tremendous pressure. Newton actually preceded us. They started a long time. Well, they started about six months before, before I showed up. Ah, okay. Um, and it was a disaster idea, you know, right from the get-go. It wasn't going to work. So we hired a bunch of people out of Newton. And there was one guy who, that Andy kept saying, we can hire this one guy. Newton collapses. We were one, one guy higher away from collapsing and he felt loyal. So he stayed. That's probably true. Newton mm -hmm. would have collapsed without, you know, without this one fellow. Um, but yes, the, the things I, I had the rights to 
to you know do take stuff out of the film. Initially, by the way, I refused to participate because the emotional story here, I think, and the personal story. I hope we get have time to get to it. Yeah, is actually more interesting to me and to others than the tech story and the business story. And it's uh, because we're all humans. Nonetheless, um, uh, the the one thing I took out of the film, I asked the, the producers. It wasn't my movie. I was just a person. Yeah. Uh, um, was some really incendiary comments about what um, John was, you know, allegedly did. I, I didn't want to hurt him. Um, still don't. I think he was very generous and kind in the film. Yeah. Um, and he was trying. He was scrambling to to both survive um, um, and try and grow, you know, the Mac, but also looking for something ahead because he was not the visionary. He was not known as a visionary. Remember. Steve Jobs recruited him on the, do you really want to make sugar water the rest of your life? Right. You know, that was the, that was the, how he closed. He was it. running Pepsi, I think, right? Running yeah. Pepsi yeah. 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 Do you really want to make sugar water the rest of your life? So John wanted to be a visionary. Just, he, he wasn't in that way. And so um, he had to do what he did in some sense. I mean, you know, the, he was going to be not at Apple. He was going to get fired if he couldn't energize Apple. And this seemed like the biggest thing ever. And so he ran a competitive process. Did, we didn't know about it. He then took a lot of our ideas and announced them as was in the film. And our people were just absolutely just rip shit angry. And, um, and you know, our idea was better because <laughs> mm -hmm. we were a smartphone. So, um, so that didn't work out very well for, for either of us. And it was, a, it was really an interesting, in retrospect, an interesting dynamic where the spin out and the, and the native company were set up in a way that both didn't have a chance to succeed. Mm. So even though it sounds smart to diversify your risk, yeah, if you're the sponsor company, it, you know, maybe. Um, so that, that was the new, it, in my life, it wasn't that big a deal uh, because um, if you ship something that's a huge success, it crushes everything anyway. And we, I thought that in this category, um, it, it would be, you know, two or three companies would take 90% of the market share. Newton wasn't going to do that. It was the wrong project. And we could. Uh, well, in exactly what you just said, Andrew, in the, in the introduction, namely, um, you know, uh, two engineers who sat 15 feet apart are you know, responsible for 98% uh, of all the smartphones on the planet. That was our plan. So, you know, so I carried on. It was, it was a matter of, so remember you asked about timing. Yeah, that's a critical thing. Critical thing. We overachieved, I guess I overachieved in engineering a spin-out. If it had taken me five years to engineer a spin-out rather than uh, two, um, it would have been better because, because, Digital cellular, which was essential, was just coming into Europe in a big way. GSM, as you recall. Mm -hmm. TDMA, CDMA, all these letters, you know, the things we were playing with were experiments. The CEO, chairman CEO of Motorola and I had a knockdown, drag out argument in his office about that. Mm. He wouldn't give me the digital technology because he said it's years and years away. It's like, you, it's a pipe dream. Use, use, you know, use this other stuff. Uh, that was wrong. Uh, it came on very quickly. It would have been there, and other things would have been there that we needed. Uh, we had to invent Telescript, which was really JavaScript. No, no, uh, and it wasn't even in the movie. So we had to create mm -hmm. Java, uh, which is an interpreted language that can run on many computers and uh, without, without having to be native into their operating system. It was essential, because you're going to run around the, uh, the, the, the cloud talking to different companies, you know, because they're, um, uh, they're the merchants on the internet. <laughs> so, so we overachieved. Our timing was lousy because we overachieved and got out of Apple too soon. And we under, you know, with a, we call the timing mm -hmm. wrong um, because the, the bits and pieces and the infrastructure just weren't there and they weren't going to be there and, and uh, for too long. Now, I asked Andy recently, hey, if we'd done it, if we'd taken a little bit more time and, you know, and so on. When would we have shipped the iPhone? And the answer was five years before Apple. Hmm. 
five years before before then. And so Steve got it right, even though he was late, uh, at, um, quite late. Um, but then again, the Mac was late. Right. You know, the Mac, the Mac, the Mac was like what the eleventh computer into the market. So being late is just fine. Hmm. Uh, actually, help if you do it better. If you do it better. Do it better. Yeah. yeah. Reduce risk. <clears throat> and do it better. Yeah, exactly right. It was just fine. So we had two timing problems, um, which we didn't know about in, until the end. We did know about the first one, which because then we slogged really hard to invent all the stuff that had to be invented. It was like, God, this is really hard work. Um, are you sure we need one of those? Yep, need one of those. So you have to go invent it. So, so um, that was the issue. So um, Kevin, one of our middle-level guys, we had a lot of very interesting middle-level guys. Pierre Medier was a low-level yeah. guy at eBay. And, I you love know, that the, part of the, the story. CTO, yeah, the CTO of you know, Adobe and the head of Safari. I mean, all these people were, you know. Um, but... Uh, Kevin, who now runs the, the, the smartwatch for Apple, uh, the iWatch, which we had specked out. <laughs> That's also in the book, right? Yeah, it's in the book. yeah <laughs> we specked out the watch. Um, um, said it very well in the film. He said, you have to build on other people's accomplishments slowly. And yeah. Um, yeah, I like that line. And in forecasting, Andy, I, th I think you and I had exactly this conversation years ago. It's it's uh, in, in future casting, let's say, people assume things are going to happen too quickly and they don't. And they assume that they're going to propagate more slowly and they don't. They propagate very quickly. Once they catch on, boom, and it's a good idea, then boom, they go. Zoom. <laughs> Once something catches on, it just explodes. But it takes a long time to get there, longer than people expect. No, we didn't know that. That wasn't in the literature at the time. No one told us that. Um, so let me let me let me just tell our, our our group here that you guys should feel free to jump in with questions, put them in the chat section, raise your virtual hand. Sure. I know some of you will have questions, um, but this is this is terrific, Mark. I mean, actually, the, Andy Hertzfeld in the movie said something just like that line about that, that you attributed to Kevin. He said we could have reached our ambitions if we'd done it in a staged fashion, yeah, right? Exactly. And so is there an element when you look back and maybe we can get into the personal here because this is such a great part of the story where you look at this and you go, hmm, maybe we were too ambitious. We should have we should have kind of crawled before we walked or did you have to go for the whole thing? Did you have Absolutely. to go for? Yeah, Absolutely. So, um, yes. So the surrounded by this, you know, rock star group of technologists and marketing uh, people. Um, my job, I, you know, in retrospect, I had two jobs as the, as the CEO, as the chairman CEO. And I chose to do one, um, maybe overachieved. It was the way you manage a team of that caliber with such high IQ and, and resume accomplishments, it at the Mac, um, is to have a vision. Did I say this in the film? I don't recall. To have a vision that is so compelling and so crystal clear, yes, I did say that, that people just guide themselves to it. Right. Uh, and, and so, you know, the heat-seeking missile, avionics, sees the light and the heat, and it goes for it. And when the light and the heat changes a little bit, it just, you know, makes the, makes the turn. But when you do that, you have to actually articulate the entire vision. At least I felt you did. Okay, so and because the vision was you know was a knockout when I when I explained it or talked about it, it was a knockout. And then uh, Alan Kay, one of his famous phrases at, at the time was was um, CEO like me. You, um, the only way you can grow a company is, is by goal cloning, G O A L. Mm -hmm. clone. So my goal, which is the vision, had to be cloned. Because the clone, the cloning then created everybody was a visionary, and so that's what I did. That was my, that was very conscious on my part. Well, that um, that was a big vision, which took, has taken twenty years to actually materialize. And so that, in some sense, I misled um, the the uh, the company by not um, uh, staging it very carefully and being really conservative. 
Because we didn't know how to ship a smartphone, a, a part of a smartphone. How do you do that? You know, so it, it, was, it was almost like we felt it was like all or nothing. Um, in retrospect, it wasn't all or nothing, but it, you know, pretty close. I mean, you had to actually do mu much of what we ended up doing. So I'm a little confused about that still. Let me but let me get Robert's I question. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me get Robert's question if I could. Um, go ahead, Robert. Yeah, hi, <clears throat> hi, Mark. Um, hi. It's a, it's a privilege to um, to meet, and the the, the movie is phenomenal. Uh, there's so much in it. It 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 goes beyond what we have time to talk uh, about here. But um, so so I worked with Philips Electronics in the ninety four oh. to two thousand. Uh, in the consumer electronics and and so this story was already quite active in Philips um, and then I left for a mobile uh, application service provider in around 2000 where we built websites for devices that were coming to market um, similarly to almost iPhone uh, looker like around right. early 2000 um, but still the market was basically on, on, on mobile phones was SMS and nobody was really using, you know, websites because of latency or the user experience. And, right. you know, I, I ended up with a couple of other startups and then with Shell and I'm in the venture capital uh, team. Uh, but I joined Shell in 2005 and that was, you know, when the iPhone pretty much started. So, and, and since then, um, one of the key challenges as a venture investor is, is clearly always what I've learned. Well, are you not too early, but we were even too early in 2000 because yeah. <clears throat> although, you know, the marketers there, even in the Netherlands, there were like 4 million handsets still the inflection with the, with the, with the consumer was not there. And, um, so I, and, and so the trade off that <clears throat> as a venture investor, we always have is, um, you know, do you bet on a management team and a CEO who has his vision to go after it? Or do I intervene and find like early revenue opportunities? And I think the film talks about, you know, the internet that was emerging and and I, it's debatable if there was any chance of getting to like early revenue opportunity, but, was, but you were working at the same time with a large group of corporates. So what was the discussion about pushing you as a CEO, finding the balance between going for the vision or going for uh, early revenue. Yeah. Um, and any, any, yeah, learnings for, you know, an investor as well, how, how we should, how we should engage with CEOs on, uh, on this topic. Yeah, that's a, that's a big question that parses into probably three or four or five different questions. With regard to us, the, the founding partners did not want or ask for, uh, early revenue. Uh, first of all, it would have made no difference in there for them at all, zero. Um, and it wouldn't have made much of a difference to, for us um, because it was a big bang theory. <laughs> um, the, you know, Hank Botts, who was your CEO at the time, saw it in exactly the same way Noria Oga saw it, in exactly the same way George Fisher saw it. It was a big bang. It was going to be a revolution. So why fiddle around with, um, you know, licensing SDKs, software developer kits or something like that? I'm not sure about And so I think every situation is different. Now, you use a very interesting adjective, uh, verb, which is, which is intervene. Uh, you know, an intervention is when someone is an alcoholic and you want to try and, you know, family, you know, gathers around them and says, really, it's time to knock off the alcohol. He didn't mean that. That was a translation probably of a Dutch word. But... Um, but the, the, the dynamic um, between the sponsor, the licensee, the investor, strategic, and the company requires empathy on both sides. So uh, my best you know, kind of recollection was um, it was really hard to get the strategics to sit in our chair in our lab, you know, in our company and just see the world from our eyes. And it was equally hard for us to sit in their chair, you know, in their boardrooms or their executive, you know, and see the world from their eyes. Um, and so alignment was going to always be difficult. Um, but, well, un unless we learn to do that. And 
because there was a kind of a, um, <clears throat> you know, the, uh, at, at Apple, suits were not useful. You know, suits were people in suits, not useful. So there was already a kind of a, um, a, a cultural mismatch that I, in retrospect, or the licensee should have taken much more care in creating cross empathy of what the other person is experiencing. And, um, and then interventions aren't as necessary because you're, you already see it from the other person's point of view and, uh, and are sympathetic. Now we did do that to a certain extent because we really liked the people who were working at Philips, at Sony, at Panasonic, we really liked them uh, because they were lower level and they, were, they, they got us, they got who we were. But by the time it went up you know, in uh, Matsushita, to get the deal done after the CEO said yes, required 13 signatures in seniority order. So in other words, Japan, you couldn't, you couldn't have a senior, senior vice president sign before the senior, 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 senior vice president signed. And number 11 was on a vacation in Hawaii. We had to stop. We had to wait for the guy to get back. So, so, you know, so no matter how much empathy we had with our team uh, correspondents, with our counterparts, they had to live in a stack of 11 layers of, in Matsushita's case, 11 layers of executives who changed. While I was there, I think they had, oh, Half of the half of the executive team, you know, cha changed. I mean, they either were moved around to different company, you know, different parts of the company, in the Japanese case, or they were fired in the you know the Phillips case, just blown away. And so, um, not easy to to do that. And that's just part of the complexity. I ended up spending probably eighty percent of my time managing the alliance with these kind of so-called interventions. The one thing that could have happened better was really honest conversations with, let's say, Motorola about digital cellular. They could have taught us a ton because they were on the ground in Europe and America. Um, and an AT&T could have taught us a ton if they'd, if they'd allowed, well, they couldn't have because they were hostile to the, to the internet. They couldn't have taught us anything um, about that. Um, and we, so that's mentoring and you don't think of mentoring in the same sense as you think of um of um talking to your investor your vc because at the end of the day they've got you by the throat so you need mentoring by someone who doesn't have you by the throat from the company mm -hmm. yeah you need mentoring from um, and you know just honest dialogue from uh, people more like you um who can explain what's going on without, you know, without then saying, and now that I've explained what's going on, you must do it. <laughs> we got some of that. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, so, no, that's, <clears throat> that's very helpful. That's, yeah, it's a people to people. It, 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 there can't be an impedance mismatch between the psychology of the people on both sides who are just talking. Uh, they should remove conference tables mm -hmm. and just sit around and talk, you know, sit on the floor. Uh, they should they, they should deformal. I mean, the strategic should deformalize. Now, can they? Well, you know, there's a there's a super ego ego thing going on. There's a parent child. So yeah. can the can the figure of authority really um, step down from, you know, are you your, are you your child's friend or are you their parent? Yeah, that's a great scene also in the in the movie about the Goldman Sachs banker who was willing to put off a shirt just to get the uh, <laughs> the deal, right? I, my my wife and I are in, were and he unfortunately died. He was a, he wasn't he was not a Goldman. He was another another bank. Um, uh, we felt we just absolutely fell in love with him um, uh, because he was that he was he was like us. You know, I would have taken my shirt off. You know, in in AT and T's offices to get the deal. <laughs> You know, yeah, and, and, beyond, and beyond the shirt, what, what else? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, passion. I guess it comes back to that point, right? So, build the connection and and really be on on have that emotional connect in order to have a, an honest conversation. I guess exactly. We're people. We are emotional and psychological people first, and we're business people and strategists and so on second. Thank you. I love that, Mark. In the few minutes we have left, let's talk a little bit more about you know, how the experience of General Magic informed your your life and your career. 
Um, I mean, one of the most inspiring parts about it uh, is, you know, and I don't remember who of the protagonists says it, the line that failure isn't the end, it's a beginning. And then the question about, you know, did this company quote unquote fail, you know, as a corporate structure it failed, but the ideas succeeded wildly, right? And so how do, how do you look at it today, 20 years later, or 15 years or whatever it is, looking back and on the things you've done uh, in terms of, you know, success and failure and, and just the legacy? You know, I didn't want to make the film. I refused to make the film because I didn't want to be vulnerable. I didn't want to show vulnerability. So I think I was, and, and I was talked into it um, because it would be good for everyone. It'd be good for, you know, for our family, the immediate family, it'd be good for everybody who participated, it'd be good for others to see it. I thought it was going to be a, you know, tiny little film that was, you know, kind of a, you know, 8,000 people would see it now, you know, maybe. So the answer starts with this profound feeling of, you know, this crushing feeling of uh, having failed, which I talked about. It took them five different video sessions, my house and the, you know, in the, at the beach, I mean, all over the place to get me to the place where I was willing to talk about that because I packaged it up as a, as a, as an experience and didn't want to revisit it. It was, it was very, very damaging personally. Um, then, you know, after everything transpired and people kept saying for years, look what you've done, look what you've done. And, and the people that came out of it, you know, were so awesome and, and they're still doing what, what they're still fulfilling parts of the, you know, of the, of the vision and, and going beyond it, which is exactly what you'd expect. Then a sense of satisfaction uh, or even closure or even a sense of life meaning came along. So, Someone mentioned the word career. You know, we were hippies uh, when, you know, when we were young and the, the career was not a good word. Not a, it was a bad word um, because it's, it, it kind of said you were going to just channel yourself into something. That's obviously silly, but that's how we felt at the time. So for me, the career um, where we try and find um, purpose and meaning in, in life, you know, why are we doing this thing? You know, business is toxic, period. Uh, and then you cover that toxicity with layers of non-toxicity. And you try and look for big money because at the end of the day, that kind of somehow justifies stuff. Um, and that's an, that's an overly you know, broad comment. Business is lovely until it becomes toxic. And then it has to be lovely again and so on. In our case, in my case, it was really damaging. And so I didn't want to go back into business uh, for a long, long time. And when I did, it was about climate change, because that, only, that was the first and only idea that was sufficiently large and important that it caught my attention. And so we tried to, as you said, we tried to reinvent cement because cement is 6% of you know, greenhouse gas. And we did. We succeeded. Um, so, but we haven't changed the world because the world couldn't adopt you know, this revolutionary thing. So. That was the fulfill in retrospect, those five years or those, if you want to stretch it all the way back to the Aspen Institute, those 12 years, or if you want to stretch it all the way back to my, you know, my PhD days at Stanford, that was like 20 days, 20 years. That was my life. That's the sum total of what I was able to contribute um, to this planet. And that's good enough. You know, as Claire, my wife says, how many people get a movie done about their, you know, their, their, experience you know so you should feel good um i did natively feel good about it for many 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 years and a divorce since which is like uh, horrible <laughs> try at all costs to avoid a divorce uh, and i don't mean a financial cost i tried all you know to, to avoid it but nonetheless it was damaging but now i see that i have done something uh, and uh, and there's now a digital record of it and, um, you know, unless we lose, unless we lose the ability to store digital content, which we might, um, <laughs> um, it's going to be there for my kids and their kids and their kids, kids. And at the end of the day, that's really all I care about in one sense, but in another sense, um, you know, this thing for a while was number one on iTunes as a movie, um, in the non feature, non fictional category for number one for weeks or months, I can't, you know, months. 
and it was on almost every airplane in the in the in the you know the major fleets in the world. Um, you know, from, from the <laughs> from the most boring like United to the most interesting like Singapore. You know, so and and I get the comments I got back were largely not about technology and were largely not about the business story or the origin story of the iPhone. They were um, emotional. They were, or, or when I say emotional, I mean they were personal. Things that came out were like shockingly, um, you know, when I read these things, it just made, made no sense to me. It's just, this is the most amazing story, revolution. When I saw the film, it changed my life. When I saw the film, I saw it three times and I, and I made my kids sit down and see it too, you know, and stuff like that. Um, so it turns out to have uh, made a difference, at least in the lives of those folks um, who saw the film and, um, and personalized it. I didn't expect that at all. Um, and I didn't expect a film to be made and I didn't expect that, that our work would be in some sense credited with uh, what's going on today. Those are all very satisfying and they, they do create a sense of closure. Um, because if we want, you know, at the very, very, very end to be known as a good person who did something for the planet, I'm still working on the first one, but the second one, I think I can put a check mark on, you know, I did something yeah. for the planet and, uh, that's good. I wish we, I wish we could go even further, Mark. This is such a fantastic dialogue. I'm so grateful for the things you've done, your time with us today. I know our colleagues are as well. Uh, and so thank you so much. And if anybody wants to follow up with Mark, I'm sure he'd be happy to hear from you, but um, we've got this recorded, Mark, and I'm glad we do. And uh, thank you again for your time today. And to the network, we're gonna take a 10 minute break now, reconvene at 12.15 for our session on the state of VC. Remember to use the other link, the other Zoom link, uh, and we will be on uh, at 12.15. Thanks again, Mark. Thanks for Thank doing you, what you're doing, Andrew. It's very, very valuable. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mark. Bye-bye.